Good morning. We start this morning with general questions. Our first question is from Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government when the Transport Secretary last met bus operators that serve Renfrewshire. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, I last met with Stagecoach on the 5th of February 2019. I also met with First Bus on the 26th of November 2018. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? McGill's Buses, the main operator running as a monopoly in many parts of Renfrewshire, have recently announced changes to services, such as axing the 907 linking Glasgow and Renfrewshire to Dunoon, and originally proposing increases of up to 62% for fares on peak time journeys between Erskine and Glasgow. The company have since backtracked and proposed fares increases of up to 30%, with local MSP Derek Mackay championing this increase as a win for passengers. Does the, the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that extortionate fare increases are only a win for bus operators and shows the need for regulating the bus industry across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I know from the discussions I've had with Derek Mackay that he was concerned about the increases that were being proposed by uh, McGill's on, uh, uh, on some of their particular uh, routes and I know that he's been making strenuous representations to them uh, in order to address that. And I do welcome the fact that McGill's have uh, sought to reduce uh, the, uh, the level of increase that they were uh, proposing. The member will also be aware that within the Transport Bill we have set out a range of options in order to help to strengthen the role that local authorities can have in how bus services are provided within their area, including that of uh, bus service improvement at partnerships in order to ensure that there's a greater recognition of local need within the way in which bus operators provide bus services. And those uh, measures, I believe, will help to strengthen the way in which we can ensure that bus services are delivered within local communities in a way which reflect their needs. And I hope that the Labour Party will support that uh, when it comes before Parliament. And Jamie Green. Thank you, President. Also, can I add my concerns to some of those uh, price uh, increases in the west of Scotland? But the Minister talks about uh, the potential of the Transport Bill to address some of these issues around local authorities setting up franchises. I haven't met a single local authority that's interested in doing this or indeed will have any money to do this. Can the Transport Secretary tell us how many local authorities have expressed interest to him enable, uh, to, to, to actually set up these local bus franchises? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Senator Officer, the member it seems to try to characterise this as though franchising is the only element which has been provided within the bill. Uh, as a member of the uh, committee that's considering this legislation, we're aware there's a range of measures which are being provided within the bill to allow local authorities a range of different options that are not available to them at the present moment. And as also been suggested to me by the committee, it may be that we should add further options uh, to the bill, and that's something which we're giving active consideration to, uh, and we'll consider that at stage two. So I think it's important that the member doesn't characterise the bill as actually offering only one option. It offers a suite of options to local authorities to consider what best meets the needs within their local communities. Question number two, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to forge greater links with Singapore. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, Scotland's international framework sets out how our international work supports the Scottish Government's central purpose of creating a more successful country. The Scottish Government values and appreciates the long and positive relationship we have built with Singapore, which has been an important trading partner for Scotland for many years. 2019 marks the 200th anniversary of trading between the UK and Singapore with the arrival of Stanford Raffles and William Farker, who was a Scot. Uh, Scottish Development International's Southeast Asia office has been based in Singapore since 2001, demonstrating our commitment to a strong relationship. In fact, Scottish direct exports to Singapore went from £585 million in 2016 to £655 million in 2017, an increase of £70 million. We will continue to promote Scotland's trade capabilities in areas such as oil and gas, food and drink and renewable energy, as well as encourage inward investments in data analytics, life sciences, energy manufacturing and tourism. Uh, we will also continue to welcome exchange between Scotland and Singapore in education and culture. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and the Cabinet Secretary acknowledges the bicentenary anniversary of the founding of modern Singapore in January of 1819. Notably two of the three main founding fathers were Scottish, uh, Major William Farker and John Crawford. Given these uh, significant historical ties, the renewed British Council NCA Singapore Memorandum of Understanding and a greater need to forge links across the world the world. Will the Cabinet Secretary support the establishment of an MOU 
Will the Cabinet Secretary support an establishment of an MOU between Creative Scotland and NCA Singapore? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'd be very pleased for an MOU between Creative Scotland and the National Arts Council of Singapore to be signed. We're welcoming 70 technology leaders from Singapore and Southeast Asia on the Connect Government Leaders Summit in Edinburgh this July. That's very positive. But can Rachel Hamilton not consider that it is a bit rich Absolutely. for the Conservatives to come to this chamber, encourage more trading links, but not leave the country to do so, Absolutely. not have our First Absolutely. Minister visit them. <laughs> She's encouraging us to help support the 14th largest export partner for Scotland, but not that that is the second. Our first minister was championing Scottish business in yeah, France yeah. this week and in the US and Canada. And can she get Boris Golden to apologise yeah. for attacking our first minister? Yeah. And isn't it about time that we presiding officer all come together support Scotland and our business trading partnerships and let's make sure that our first minister and this parliament can fly the flag for Scotland Yay! Yay! Tom Arthur thank you presiding officer uh, following on uh, from reports of cancelled trade talks with China and souring relations with Japan as a consequence of the high-handed approach of the UK government, which has indeed been described as gunboat diplomacy. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline the approach that the Scottish government takes and how that benefits Scotland in contrast to the reckless and incompetent approach that we have seen undertaken by the UK government? Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, in that considered uh, question, I, I, I do want to, to explain to Parliament that we are currently working on uh, our trading nation, uh, a plan for growing Scotland's exports, and we're expecting that to be published in spring 2019. But it is of serious, serious concern in terms of diplomatic activity that not just the Defence Secretary, but also, very importantly, uh, Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, have jeopardised very important trade uh, discussions. Uh, the EU and Japan and as we know, have just signed uh, an agreement that's come into implementation in relation to um, customs and exchange and exports. Uh, that's very important to business across the UK, but particularly in Scotland. Uh, and I think it's very worrying indeed that some of the cack-handed approaches that we've seen from the UK government is symptomatic of uh, how they're treating the, the uh, Brexit situation generally. I think it's really, really important that we all get behind our companies at this very, very uh, fragile and difficult times for our export companies and that needs leadership from the top and that does not need bumbling diplomacy that we've seen from the UK yeah. government. Question number three, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the importance of food banks in supporting people in receipt of universal credit. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, even the UK Government has finally recognised after years of mounting evidence that rolling out universal credit has increased the need for food banks. Universal credit has caused huge damage and pushed people into debt and hardship and we will continue to call for no one to be migrated to universal credit until its fundamental flaws have been fixed and it works for people, not against them. Recognising that people have been badly hit by UK government welfare cuts and to protect vulnerable communities against the economic damage of Brexit, last month I announced a further £500,000 investment in Fairshare, who will further support organisations that are responding to food insecurity. This is in addition to our 3.5 million Fair Food Fund to tackle food insecurity. Presiding officer, though, though it is shocking we have to take such measures because we want to reach more of the people who will need the help most. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In my constituency, Kirkcaldy Food Bank has seen a 90% increase from a period December 2017 to December 2018. Does this Cabinet Secretary agree that Amber Rudd's recent acknowledgement of the link between the rollout of universal credit and the increased use of food banks is too little too late and that the cruel and callous actions of the UK government has caused untold misery for thousands of families living across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do. It is a long overdue acknowledgement from Amber Rudd, but acknowledgement <coughs> alone won't help families in Fife, Scotland or the rest of the UK. And what Amber Rudd needs to now do is to act and to change this failed system. And that means reversing the benefits capped and the benefits freeze and the abhorrent rape clause. And then <coughs> we can then start to see the progress, which doesn't leave people uh, relying on food banks for that basic of need. And Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Since the Cabinet Secretary is clearly aware of the increasing necessity of food banks, something that's frankly shocking 
since we shouldn't need Victorian-style charity in 21st century Scotland, does she agree that the £5 child benefit top-up that Labour have been calling for would make a big difference to many families, including those in receipt of universal credit? Well, that's why we're working currently on uh, an income supplement, as the member knows. Uh, but I think what the members should also do is recognise that we need to work together to put the pressure on the UK government to recognise the failed system of universal credit, the impeding cliff edge that many people will face if there is a no deal uh, exit from the EU, which will punish those with least financial resilience the most. And does she not agree that we should uh, unite on that uh, message, especially when we've had to announce £500,000 to prepare for Brexit to tackle food insecurity, which we know will happen if there is a no deal uh, exit from the European Union? Uh, Union. That, quite frankly, is ridiculous and is, is tantamount to the reckless uh, actions of the UK government, which will be punishing people who have least uh, in this society the most. And that is an absolute shocking indictment of the UK's approach to welfare reforms. Question for Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to modernise facilities at Kirkcaldy Sheriff Court. Minister Ash Denham. This question relates to operational matters that are the responsibility of the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service. The service is currently creating a two-court criminal annex within Kirkcaldy Police Station to hear sheriff and jury cases and custody hearings. And this is due to be fully operational by autumn 2019. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Minister for that response and I welcome the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service investment of £3.7 million to modernise facilities at Kirkcaldy Sheriff Court in line with recent recommendations from HM Inspectorate of Prisons. In the context of the new Protecting Vulnerable Witnesses legislation, is there now an opportunity for Kirkcaldy Sheriff Court to lead the way um, in developing a pilot suite for child witnesses to give evidence on commission with the ethos of the Barna House approach at its heart? Minister. Um, I'm glad that the member has made mention of the vulnerable witnesses legislation and I am aware of the detailed consideration that Jenny Gilruth and also her colleagues on the Justice Committee have already given the important reforms that are in this bill. In terms of investing in facilities, the Scottish Government has already provided £950,000 of funding to support the creation of new child and vulnerable witness friendly hearing suites in Glasgow and made another £1.1 million available to court service to upgrade other venues and also IT. As part of um, this upgrading work, the court service are also procuring portable recording equipment and camera operators, and that will allow some commission hearings to take place in sheriff court buildings across Scotland. We are exploring how the Barnhouse concept could operate in Scotland, and we have asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland and also the Care Inspectorate to develop Scotland-specific standards, which will set out a roadmap for developing our approach. Question number five, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Falkirk Council to discuss the proposed growth deal for the district. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. My officials last met with representatives of Falkirk Council to discuss, to discuss the development of their growth deal proposal on the 16th of January this year. Uh, the next meeting is scheduled for the 20th of March uh, when progress with the growth deal will feature on the agenda for a meeting of the Falkirk Economic Partnership. As part of our aim for 100% coverage of Scotland with growth deals, uh, this government fully supports Falkirk's uh, deal proposal. Uh, we look uh, to the UK government uh, to join us in common purpose and ensure that as much progress is made towards that goal in 2019 as possible. Angus MacDonald. Cabinet Secretary, for his uh, reply, I'm aware that the Leader of Falkirk Council is meeting with the Secretary of State for Scotland today to discuss the proposed growth deal and I clearly hope for a positive outcome from these talks. Given the significant investment plans by the private sector, not least the seven national scale developments underway are being considered at present for Grangemouth, will the Cabinet Sec Secretary highlight to the Secretary of State when he next meets him that the gross value added from the proposed growth deal would be in excess of £330 million across Falkirk District? and that it will it, it'll set a new course locally for sustainable, inclusive growth. Cabinet Secretary. I will, uh, and I will continue to highlight the potential benefits of the growth deal for the Falkirk area. When I last met with the Secretary of State for Scotland to discuss growth deals at the end of January, I asked again for the UK Government to give a formal commitment to 100% coverage of Scotland with growth deals. I am conscious that Falkirk Council 
is one of only three local authority areas uh, that still does not have a formal commitment from the UK Government on this matter. And my view is that working in partnership uh, with the Scottish Government to achieve that uh, would mean that real benefits for local communities right across the Falkirk Council area uh, could be achieved in generating the investment that Angus Macdonald has highlighted, helping to create new jobs and helping to create wider economic prosperity within the Falkirk Council area. Alison Harris. Thank you. Um, as has been mentioned previously, the Secretary of State is meeting with representatives from Falkirk Council to discuss plans today. And I'm sure we all agree that the city and regional deals that thus far have gone through have been beneficial for Scotland. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he could just assure me that any potential growth deal in Falkirk will include the regeneration of the town centre specifically, and not as, just as currently is on the table going eastwards down towards Grangemouth? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I'm aware that the Secretary of State for Scotland is meeting with uh, Falkirk Council today and I hope at the end of that meeting with Cecil Meikle John, the leader of the Council, David Mundell will give a commitment on the part of the UK Government uh, to supporting a Falkirk uh, Council growth deal which they have not provided uh, to date. Uh, but the member will recognise actually that the, uh, uh, the various issues that are highlighted within a growth deal are for the partners to determine, not the Scottish Government. Uh, and the content of that growth deal is one which is shaped in partnership uh, with the different agencies who have an interest in developing that growth deal and is not directed by the Scottish Government. But no doubt they will be looking at a whole range of regeneration uh, projects that can help to support and sustain the Falkirk economy going forward in the years ahead. And question six, Keith Brown. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on the Stirling and Clipmanishire city region deal? Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, so officer, the Scottish Government and its agencies are in ongoing and constructive engagement with the regional partners as we seek to progress the Stirling and Clipmanishire city region deal uh, towards its final deal signing. Keith Brown. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and point out the investment of £45.1 million in the Scottish Government and £40.1 million in the UK Government is indeed a welcome transformative opportunity for both Club Manager and Stirling. As the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, the UK Government pledged £8 million to Club Manager as part of the deal to be developed collaboratively with Club Manager Council and other local partners. I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary his view and reports that the UK Government is actively considering bids for this fund from out with the agreed formal governance structures, despite the risks of proper partnership working and the viability and sustainability of projects, and to seek the Cabinet Secretary's assurance that when considering bids for the Scottish Government funds, he will ensure the integrity of the local decision-making process is maintained. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senior officer, I am aware of the concerns as they were raised with me by the leader of Clark Manager Council and I raised these very issues with the Secretary of State for Scotland when I met with him uh, at the beginning of February. Uh, the Secretary of State has acknowledged uh, the need to have proper governance and also assurance uh, around the process and he has assured me uh, that he was dealing with the concerns which had been expressed by Clark Manager Council about the competing bids uh, for projects to be funded through the Clark Manager fund. My officials understand that there has been a constructive meeting now taking place uh, between Clark Manager Council and the UK Government uh, to discuss these very concerns around the Clark Manager Fund uh, and we expect to get feedback from that in the coming days. What I can assure the member of is that I am very clear that regional partners need to be at the very centre of any city deals or growth deals. Uh, Stirling and Clark Manager have already established a city-region deal joint committee to oversee uh, and direct implementation and delivery of the city-region deal. And the Scottish Government is clear that this committee has to be an integral part of any decision-making process. And that's part of the agreement which we have in place with this particular city deal. And I'll continue to assert that view as we go forward with this deal and any other deals across the country. And Dean Lockhart. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary welcome the investment of more than £45 million from the UK Government in the Stirling and Clack Manager City deal? And this includes £10 million for the establishment of a new national tartan centre which will create jobs and boost tourism in the Stirling region. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I welcome any investment alongside the other £45 million which has been invested by the Scottish Government, which I'm sure the member also welcomes uh, in order to make sure we do everything we can 
to help to support the regional economy within Stirling and Clackmannanshire. But equally, it's also important that that funding is utilised in a way which actually sticks to the agreement. And that is to recognise that our regional partners, particularly local authorities, are key to the decision making and how that funding is used. And I hope that the UK Government will ensure that that process is adhered to with this particular growth deal. Thank you. That concludes uh, general questions. Before we move on to First Minister's questions, could I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Mr. Vegar Stroman, Ambassador of Norway. And would you also uh, join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Mr. Dan Mihalaki, Ambassador of Romania. <laughs> 